So I'd like to share with you as our invocation, the poem in Flanders Fields, followed by We Shall Keep the Faith by Moyne Michael. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard, amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If he break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Then we shall keep the faith. Oh, you who sleep in Flanders fields, sleep sweet to rise anew. We caught the torch you threw, and holding high, we keep the faith with all who died. We cherish, too, the poppy red that grows on fields where valor led. It seems to signal to the skies that blood of heroes never dies, but lends a luster to the red, the flower that blooms above the dead in Flanders fields. And now the torch and poppy red we wear in honor of our dead. Fear not that ye have died for naught. We'll teach the lesson that ye brought in Flanders fields. Thank you, David. I neglected to uh, mention that David is the pastor here in our post in uh, church. First Presbyterian Church in Worcester. If they will continue to please uh, stand and give your attention to the presentation of colors in our national anthem. The colors are presented today by the 555th Honors Detachment.
please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the States of America, to the Republic, and one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you, members of the um, 555th Attachment. You may have noticed uh, we had originally had uh, Todd Patterson. Many of you know who Todd Patterson is. He was to uh, sing the national anthem uh, for us today. It, we just found out that his mother passed away this morning, and obviously, for obvious reasons, he, he was not able to join us today. So our, our thoughts and prayers are with uh, Todd and, and his family, the passing of his mother, Lee Patterson. Lee's husband was also a longtime Rotarian, Bill Patterson. Um, so thoughts and prayers to the family. Okay, a um, couple, couple of birthday announcements today. I uh, found out that uh, John Foster, a retired Navy veteran, is the uh, husband of Becky Foster. His birthday was today. And Sandra Hall, somebody told me that her birthday was also today. So happy birthday, Sandra. So... Please be seated. At this time, I would like to introduce Susan Bateman, representing the Tree Quilters, Tree City Quilters, sorry, in the Honor Our Patriots Service Organization for a special World War II Veterans presentation. Susan. Good to be with you today. I represent the Tree City Quilters Guild here in Worcester. We're a large group, about 75 members, and our mission is to honor our patriot service with patriotic quilts. Um, I also belong to the Quilts of Valor Foundation which is a national organization, and their mission the is, question, is this other service members and veterans touched by war with comforting and healing quilts about. But we honor not only those touched by war, any, though, any of those who have served in our military. Um, we started a program um, four years ago at the Wayne County Fair to honor our Patriot service. And we were made aware of a large number 
of veterans in Wayne County. And so the first year, 2021, we honored, we honored 57 veterans. The next year, we honored 84 veterans. And the following year, we had to cut it off at 100. That's all the quotes we could make in a year. And then this year, we have also done 100 quilts, and we plan to do that as long as we can to honor and thank as many veterans in Wayne County as we can. Um, Vicki Hersler and Jerry Fickus are the heads of the committee, and they are out of town for they would be up here doing this. Um, we also have Dory Miller, Frank Meshu. Um, Jolene Dyer, Peggy Christman, Gina Herbert, Monica Sved as members of our committee. Um, so we have here today, hopefully, four, three, three or four um, World War II veterans that have not received quilts of valor. So we will start out um, with Conrad Kennedy. Um, and Peggy Chrisman will present him with his quilt of valor. If he could stay standing. <clears throat> Conrad served in the Navy. He um, was in the Great Lakes area stationed in Michigan. Uh, shipped to California. He worked in the machine shop on base. He um, served at Moffett Field, repaired airplanes. So, thank you, Conrad. Okay, Robert Irons. Robert uh, served in 1945 to 46 in the Philippines, and um, he was drafted during his junior year in high school. Yeah, junior year in high school. Um, I guess, as I understand, he came back and finished high school after he served. He um, served in the Great Lakes also. So, thank you, Robert. Is um, Rex Riggs here? Oh, he is. Okay. We were watching for him, but missed him coming in. So I don't have information on Rex except that he served in the Air Corps. So, Dory Miller is presenting him with this quilt. And I think he is here with two of his children. Thank you. And then um, we have uh, George Spencer, who could not be here, but his daughter is here. Debbie Becker, and he is um, in a care center. He served in the Navy and served on the USS Care Care Service um, in 1946. So she will present him with his quilt of valor and thank him for his service. And we also want to recognize Walter Slater, who is, uh, has already received a quilt of valor. So he's, that's there, he's standing up now. And he's also a World War II veteran. We want to thank all of our veterans for their service and sacrifice in serving our nation. Thank you.
to again honor all World War II veterans present here today and all those that served in forces around the world as the greatest generation. Thank you to the representatives of OPS for being here today and all that you do to recognize our veterans. For all of our veteran Rotary members, families and guests, so all veterans who are here today, stand if you're able. If not, please just raise your hand to be recognized. Veterans? Thank you for joining us. At Mr. Rotary, we are always pleased to have guests, and we have many guests today. So we would also like all the other guests to please stand and be recognized, and thank you for coming with veterans to support them. Any guests? We'll turn it over to John Scott. The Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency's mission is to provide the fullest possible accounting for our missing personnel from past conflicts, to provide that accounting to their families and to the nation. Within this mission, they search for missing personnel from World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, the Cold War, and the Gulf Wars and other recent conflicts. Their research and operational missions include coordination with hundreds of countries and municipalities around the world. After careful deliberation and for statistical accounting purposes, the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, DPAA, established March 29, 1973, as the start date for the Past Conflict Personnel Accounting Mission. So their numbers were started to be counted on that day. This date marks the establishment of the United States Army Central Identification Laboratory in Thailand and, re and reflects the start of the continuous lineage of past conflict personnel accounting by all organizations that preceded DPAA. And by defining this date in 1973, that ensures that the total number of accounted personnel that comes from different countries that, it, that is reported to the public and reported to Congress uh, is consistent and accurate. At present, more than 81,158 Americans remain missing from World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, and the Gulf War and other conflicts. Out of the missing, 75% of the losses are located in the Indo-Pacific region, and over 41,000 of the missing are presumed lost at sea due to ship losses, known aircraft water losses, and other water casualties. A brief accounting of those accounted for and still missing. From World War II, 1,677 accounted for, 72,000 still missing. Korea, 705 accounted for, 7,452 still missing. Vietnam, 1,067 accounted for, 1,574 still missing. From the Cold War, two accounted for, 126 still missing. And from the Gulf War and Libya operations, zero accounted for, and six remain missing. National POW, National POW MIA Recognition Day was established in 1979 by President Jimmy Carter. And since then, every president has issued an annual proclamation to keep commemorating the third Friday in September as National POW MIA Recognition Day. 
in addition to the national ceremony observances, such as this one of National POW MIA Recognition Day, are held across the country on military installations, ships at sea, state capitals, schools, and veterans facilities. No matter when or where they are held, the recognition of POW MIA are share, share the common purpose of honoring those who were held captive and returned, as well as those who remain missing. Let us observe a moment of silence for those who remain unaccounted for. Thank you. Uh, this was a period uh, in the program. This was a period in the program where we were going to have another uh, song sung by Todd Patterson, but instead of doing that, we're going to uh, we're going to play his music, and then we're going to watch the slide presentation, which will show the flags of the branches of the armed forces. As you hear the song of your branch being played, please stand up and be recognized. Mm -hmm.
Well, it's truly a pleasure to be back up here at the microphone again. I'm sure you didn't miss me much over the last year. <laughs> it's really an honor for me today to be introducing fellow Rotarian and veteran Frank Relly. Frank emigrated to the United States in 1951 from Landshut, West Germany. He enlisted in the United States Army in 1970 and served proudly in the 3rd Infantry Division, known as the Old Guard in Washington, D.C. While serving in the Old Guard, he participated in many internments at Arlington National Cemetery and other ceremonial duties at the White House. Rubbermaid brought him to Worcester with the Gott acquisition in 1988. He later worked at Roadway Express in Akron for nine years when Yellow merged with them. He also is a holder of a U.S. patent. He was responsible for rebranding Boys Village to the Village Network in 2006. He also served as executive director of the Wayne County Community Foundation. Frank joined Rotary in March 2007 and has served on the Board of Directors, Veterans Committee, and chaired the Scholarship Committee. Candy, his wife, who's here today, and Frank were married in 1972. Both of their children are Worcester graduates. Monica is a teacher in Bath, Maine, and Dr. Nick practices dentistry in Worcester. Fellow Rotarians and guests, Frank Rowley. Thank you so much. Maybe you can help me uh, pronounce my name. It's Ferenc Matyash All right, can you say reference? Or say every reference. Well, you can do better than that. Reference. Okay, now we're going to take the RE off the front. What do you have left? Ferenc, all right. And in Hungarian, the C's are soft, so you still have Ferenc. All right, in Hungarian, you roll your R's. You can do that, okay? So it's Ferenc, it's Matyas, and Relak. Can you do that one? Let's try it one time. Ferenc, Matyas, Relak. And of course, I'm a junior. Let's see. I was born in the DP camp, which is a displaced person camp in Lunsford, and you all saw that in your, your programs there. Um, just uh, post World War II in Germany, camp was uh, previously a sub camp of the Dachau concentration camp. We lived in a tent for a while, my mom and I. Uh, my father had to live across to the other end of the, the, the town uh, in uh, a dormitory, which was for, strictly for men. We immigrated to the United States in November 1951 aboard the USS General C.C. Ballou. It was a troop transport. Uh, we had to be diverted about 100 miles because of this terrible storm that occurred. I remember seeing, looking out the, uh, the windows, uh, and there'd be the sky, and there would disappear and be water. And the sky, and there would disappear and be water. Um, they had to strap us in our bunks with rifle, rifle slings so we wouldn't fall out. And we were sponsored uh, by the uh, Congregation of Brookwood Presbyterian Church in Columbus, Ohio. I'm a graduate of Eastmore High School, which is probably well known for having uh, Archie Griffin be one of their key uh, uh, alumni. I think my sister graduated for him. I enrolled in pre-med at OSU. I quit school, I enlisted in the army, and I wanted to go to Vietnam to be medevac. I wanted to save lives. A winter storm caused a Piedmont propeller plane, which was taking us to Fort Bragg, which is normally called also Vietnam in those days. The army bus collided with a um, an auto with another car, so we're out there for about four, an extra four hours with uh, no heat and whatever. And it was uh, February, and it was very, very cold. I ended up getting URI, double lung pneumonia, a spinal tap, and was rolled in the snow to get my temperature down. And after two weeks, I finally get to a new uh, platoon and start this basic all over again. The bad news was that the medical corps, which is what I wanted to get into, 
was being filled only with conscientious objectors at that time. So after basic training, I was assigned to the Infantry Combat Training Unit uh, down at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. This is a picture of uh, Colonel James Lay, Brigadier Commander, and he presented me with what was called the Outstanding Trainee Award, which I have up there. Uh, and I was one of seven trainees out of 5,000 that were interviewed or would be interviewed for the Old Guard. And they offered it to me and I accepted it. The 3rd Infantry, wow, what a great group. Also referred to as the President's Escort, oldest active duty unit in the, uh, the Army serving our nation since 1786, conducts uh, the memorial affairs to honor our fallen comrades, ceremonies, special events, greets dignitaries, guards the Tomb of the Unknowns, provides defense support to civil authorities, uh, when we have things like riots and civil disobedience. So here's a map of Washington, and A is the Lincoln Memorial, you can see it. B is Fort Myer and the National Cemetery. C is the Pentagon. D is, at that time, Ronald Reagan, I think it was Dulles at that time, National Airport. And E is where the Anacosta River and Washington Channel and Potomac kind of all come together. And that is uh, where Fort Leslie J. McNair is, and that is where I was uh, stationed. Also, for you uh, NCIS guys, okay, uh, if you look at the S under, Ana under Anacosta, and you move your little finger there about, uh, about two blocks over, you can see the NCIS headquarters. For Washington, D.C. The Old Guard was, just like I mentioned, established in 1791. It's the third, or, or, excuse me, the uh, Fort Leslie McNair was established in 1791. It's the third oldest U.S. post, and it's located on the D.C. side of the Potomac. Now, that's a really important fact because one of the duties of the Old Guard is first line of president, first line of defense for the president of the United States as far as the army is concerned. The Marines take a priority on that, but we fall right in behind in terms of the army to do that. And we're on the Potomac side of the river, which is also the same side as the Capitol and the White House. So being on the right side of the river made us very, very important in terms of a, a, a unit in the Alpha Company. And we did a lot of training to make sure that uh, no harm was done to the president or anything was also going on. That particular uh, post had 16 generals and 24 top NCOs living on it. It was also the place where the conspirators of the Lincoln's assassination were imprisoned and hung. And my barracks were the very first U.S. federal penitentiary. And it was a very spit and shine, polished type of brigade. So in other words, at 6 a.m., you heard kaboom. And at 1700, kaboom. That meant reveille and retreat. And, and retreat was followed with taps. This is what a old guard standard uh, gravesite detail is. It's eight plus one, that's seven uh, with the rifles. One uh, shooting uh, firing party commander and a bugler. And this is in Arlington. The Old Guard is also responsible for honoring and taking care of the uh, uh, what we would refer to as the uh, 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 hold on here. the Tomb of the Unknowns. I'm just trying to think of something else here. Uh, the sarcophagus at the head and contains the W1, WW1 unknown. At the left of that crypt is a W2 unknown, and at right is a Korean conflict. Between the two lies a crypt that once was contained the unknown from Vietnam. For, uh, it was Air Force First Lieutenant Michael Blossy, whose remains were positively identified by DNA testing and removed. The guard for the tomb has never, never left their position as guard, no matter what, what kind of storms, uh, what kind of hurricanes, what kind of crazy people, 
Um, it's an impressive, to me, impressive thing. They've been doing that since 1948. Um, I had the, to maintain and qualify on a group of different weapons. The weapon that we used primarily for uh, our duty was the M14 rifle. And of course, the combat rifle, which we used for combat, was the M16. And of course, I had to qualify on all the others and had to learn how to take them apart, clean them, etc. You notice in there, there's also a riot control shotgun, 12 gauge. All right. Because in those days, we had a lot of conflict in many different parts of the United States. As a matter of fact, you may find this hard to believe, especially if you're under the age or if you were born under the under the years of 1960, okay? But in 19, it's the summer of 1967, there were 150 cities in the United States that had riots. Here is the uh, old guard uh, drill team. They're practicing for something called torchlight tattoo. Both of the things that are practicing right now, they don't do anymore because they are so dangerous. Uh, this is throwing a rifle with a bayonet uh, in front of a person, uh, both sides, okay? Just nicking their ear or their nose. The other one is where you have a, a column and on the outside area, the First leader there throws the rifle in the air. The column continues to move. The column people try put their uh, rifles ahead one. At the very end, the guy catches the rifle coming at him okay, without looking in the air. Again, those things have been removed because they're just they're way too dangerous. As a matter of fact, when I was there and saw this, they were doing it on asphalt, okay, drilling it, and they were using their regular ceremonial uh, back, uh, Bayonets, which was just chrome, and one of those M14s came straight down in the asphalt and stuck in the asphalt and just waved right there. This is my very first parade practice at the Old Guard. They take everything very seriously, so I'm not doing my eyes right enough, and I got definitely chewed out for that and I learned a lesson. Also, the uh, if you look at the boots and also your uh, oxfords that you had, they had boot, it's sole buildups and they had a boot clicker. Okay, so when you put your heels together, you would all hear, and that was the whole point, all hear a big clunk. You never heard a ching, 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 ching. That was definitely not what you should do. This is my first parade uh, in dress blues. Everything was practice and practice more. Inspect and inspect more. Uh, you know, I'm wearing red suspenders. Every wore suspenders under their blues because you wouldn't wear one of a belt and then put another belt on top because you'd look like a pregnant person. I was extremely fortunate. For eight weeks, I got the opportunity to uh, work with the old guard. Um, sent me out to a presidential classroom for young Americans. It's a tremendous program. It's still available. Um, very, it's not as available as it used to be, but allowed high school students from all over the United States and the 200 some DOD schools out there throughout the world to spend one week in Washington, DC and get really down and dirty with uh, different government officials, their undersecretaries, and find out what they're doing and learn about the constitution, learning about how they do everything. And we had some wonderful, wonderful speakers, including in the military. And you see General Westmoreland there. Uh, there was uh, so many that you can't imagine. And I was fortunate enough, I initially got there as to be a security guard. And somebody said, does anybody here learn how to type? And I said, oh, I do. So they took me up with security guard duty. And uh, so I ended up writing the daily newspaper out there, which told all the students where they were supposed to go and who was going to be talking to them and whatever, which meant that I normally got to bed about three in the morning every single day so they'd be ready the next day for their classes. This is a picture of uh, Colonel uh, Myron Lee, the battalion commander at the time. 
and I was recognized as the Old Guard Battalion Soldier of the Month. Um, and the there's a lot of practice, as I mentioned. So they have a practice parade. It was an indoor one. And so uh, I was the uh, object of that particular that parade. And I got to review all the troops to the battalion. It was pretty cool. Uh, one of my first off-post uh, gravesite details was as a firing party, firing party commander uh, in the uh, Arlington area. This is me reviewing the troops and also part of my firing squad. We also had lots and lots, I can't under, I'll under the, underline that enough, lots of training for in, uh, infantry duty, um, because quite frankly, you know, we were the first line of defense for certain different components of the government. And uh, you'll see us uh, working there on the right-hand side with the Marine Corps down at uh, Quantico, working with the Marines as well on some of this training. And that training was required. Lots of riot control training, okay? Because in those days, as I mentioned, there was a, there was a lot of un, unease in our country. As a matter of fact, on May Day, 1971, and you may want to look this up on your internet eventually, find out exactly what that it says, but um, there was a group that would want to make sure that we could stop the Vietnam War by stopping the government. Now remember, this is the time before cell phones. All right, so if you got to your office, you could work. If you couldn't get to your office, you more than likely couldn't get anything done. So they sent this flat, this map out, told everybody what they were going to do, and asked for more people to help them to block the roads, build barricades, stop the bridges, the works. Of course, they knew that Uncle Sam also had a few people coming out. So the 82nd came out from Fort Bragg, I think about 10,000. And there were about another 15,000 came out of the MDW. And uh, the old guard, let me back up one second. You'll, uh, so they had about close to 35,000, I think, uh, troops available to handle that particular situation and just help the existing uh, force that was there. About 39,000 protesters, these are the people that lost children, if you want to call it, in the 60s. And they were there in West Potomac Park. By the end of the week, they were uh, influenced by a lot of hardcore agitators. And the Park Patrol re reneged their uh, Per, uh, permit, and they all had to leave about three in the morning. So these were all kind of doped up, whatever people, it was the smartest thing they ever did. So got all those kids out of there, and they couldn't get large numbers put together. Uh, there were, uh, I think, about 70,000 by the end of that day, or they week, and then they added another 100,000 to it. And you can see some of the, uh, uh, the graffiti that was done to our monuments. The bridges were all blocked, the cars were turned over. Um, the, air, the choppers came in. Uh, the police arrested the first day 7,000 civilians. In the three day period, there was the largest mass incarceration of civilians of 12,600. You said, Where did you put 12,600 people? Well, after all the three states, Virginia and the DC and Maryland, there was a space available between beside RFK Stadium at the day, in those days, and I put I think about 30, 32 or 3,300 people behind this chain lift fence without any water, without any sanitation, whatever, it was no pretty sight. So real quickly, I spent four days in the White House. Um, we were in a, a secure area. It was a tunnel that led out to the um, uh, South Lawn, people were climbing over the fence, the metal fence, to get into the White House or do something. Uh, the White House Security Patrol, along with the Park Patrol, okay, were handling it fairly well. And then it started to get really bad. And so we were then uh, called on for about nearly hour, five hours. We stood in that portico with uh, fixed bayonets and chambered live rounds. And we didn't have to go out. Thank God. And as I get close and close to leaving the, uh, the service here was a, a duty that was done, a parade for the Defense uh, Secretary Melvin Laird, who was retiring. And you'll see that there's uh, 
a lot of people that you may recognize. And this is my goodbye to Arlington Cemetery. That's my my squad. And then I don't think do I have enough time to talk a little on my on my shot for time? Anybody? Okay. Uh, real quickly, there were some really unique situations. Everything was very straightforward. But a high school school, my very first um, funeral was a high school class from Iowa. 126 students, the entire class, came from Iowa to this person's funeral. He was in Vietnam for 10 days, stepped on a claymore or a mine, and was killed. The second one was a mother where her, or her son was in the 50s, uh, I think a, mar a, a major or something. He was killed in Vietnam. And uh, we waited and we waited with about 45 minutes in a very drizzly rain. We're ready to leave. And finally, a car comes up. That's the two people out, her and her sister. Taps her, loan, flag is given. And suddenly, out of nowhere, like a spring, she jumps and throws her body on top of the casket and will not let go. Two hours later, finally, someone was able to convince her to let go and she wanted to go into that, that hole with her son. And finally, Artie Murphy. Artie Murphy was the most decorated war hero in World War II. And we thought we'd get a huge number of people to show up there. Remember, this is a lot of conflict in those days against the wars and whatever. So there were both demonstrators and people that wanted to go to Arlington. So we had a lot of different duty to do just making sure that we could handle the people that were coming and the right kind of people, if you want to call that, so there weren't disturbances. The only good thing I did was I ushered a lot of cars and open doors, and I did open door for somebody that was part of the eulogy. He was at that time a senator from Texas, which eventually became a president. So thank you for letting me talk to you about this today. Thank you, parents. Pass, let's see. Uh, please give your attention now to the Soldier's Cross ceremony. The ceremony will be presented by the Vietnam Veterans of America, Barry P. Caruso, Chapter 255. Welcome back, Hans. And especially my brothers of the Corps. We have a couple of them up here. And as you know, yesterday we celebrated 249th day of the Marine Corps birthday. This is all because of thanks to Lieutenant General Lejeune. So, with that saying, saying that, look out for November 10th, being a Monday, 2025. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, excuse me, Don't forget the fallen veterans. Although Memorial Day is designed to honor those who lost their lives through military service, people can still honor fallen veterans 
on Veterans Day by sharing stories, placing flags at veterans cemeteries, or performing the Soldier's Cross as we were requested. The Vietnam Veterans of America of Worcester Chapter 255 are proud to present the Battlefield Cross. Sergeant Ward. Here for Sergeant April. Staff Sergeant Austin. Here for Sergeant Pato. Lance Corporal Powell. Lance Corporal Powell. Lance Corporal David Lawrence Powell. I will read the poem, Last Roll Call. We stand in, you, in formation to honor a brother who served his nation. One by one, names are read. His tears begin to shed. His name is called, there is no sound, just silence all around. Three times in all, his name is said. For he cannot answer, for he is dead. Is Lance Corporal David Lawrence Powell's here available? Yes, person. Please present the rifle. The rifle and the fixed is the most important tool to the United States fighting man or woman. It is the core to their livelihood and the key to their survival. It is thrust into the ground, signifying that one being remembered died in battle fighting to the end. It also signifies the battle is over when the rifles left this way. The boots. The boots carry a service member through the fight of our freedom. They are the first and most important means of transportation. The boots are placed at the base of the rifle. They are warm and dirty. Remember to us that the final march to the last battle. Dog tags. The dog tags are worn for each service member. They have been printed into them all the important identification information regarding that individual. The dog tags are hung from the rifle 
so that the name of the fallen will never be forgotten. The helmet. The helmet is an important piece of protection on the battlefield. Some believe that the hats or the helmet of the individual, individual represents what that person stood for. And so the helmet is placed on top of the rifle, signifying that the battle is over and that a great sacrifice has been made. It will never be worn again. He will never shoot another round. How will never shoot another round? His rifle is in the ground. I see the boots he used to wear. They are empty. Now he isn't there. Forever remember the day he died. Remember today when we all cry. So on this day, we say goodbye. Then our hearts, he'll never die. The soldier's battlefield cross stands in tribute and memory as we honor and remember and never forget. Detail left and right face. Dismissed.
Well, we're almost done. Just a couple things before Tom closes this out. At the end of the program, will all the veterans please come forward? We're going to do a joint group picture. And at that time, we will give each veteran one of the specially made rotary challenge coins. Now, for those that weren't in the military and don't know what a challenge coin is, I'll tell you what the whatever they tell you on the computer here. So the challenge coin is a small coin or medallion bearing an organization's insignia or emblem and carried by the organization's members. Traditionally, they might be given to prove membership when asked and to enforce enhanced morale. They are also collected by service members and law enforcement personnel. Historically, challenge coins were prevented, presented by unit commanders in recognition of special achievement by a member of the unit. They could also be exchanged in recognition of visits to an organization. So we have one of these for each member, uh, each veteran present today. So please come up after. Thank you, Greg. If you are able, please stand in silence as we remember Rotarian veterans who have passed away in recent years and remembering all veterans, families, and those that serve today in harm's way. Pride Web, February 9th, 2011. William Lee Culp, October 29, 2012. Stanley Galt, June 29, 2016. Joseph Ressler, February 2nd, 2017. Lud Hawk, January 31st, 2018. Sam Shapiro, February 15th, 2018. Bob Breeden, January 20th, 2019. Gordon Giffen, February 19, 2020. David Briggs, June 13, 2020. Robert Pete Bogner, February 28, 2021. Charles Franks, January 14, 2022. Charles Doherty, April 22nd, 2022. Walter C. Grossjean, July 18, 2022. Thank you all for coming today. We stand adjourned. Thank you.